So I'm originally from Quincy, Illinois, but uh, that's Western Illinois, but I've lived in Carbondale and Southern Illinois now for about 10 years. And so I started working and learning in the green industry in Quincy over 10 years ago. But as I became more and more interested in design, the design part of things, I've, I've become more and more interested in native plants. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you today. Okay, so let's start off with looking at the idea of sustainable landscaping and how that connects with choosing what are known as native plants in the creation of our residential and public landscapes. So there are lots of plants that are commonly used in landscape design, which can be thought of as sustainable, but are not specifically native. So an example of a very popular landscape plant that is non-native but has been considered sustainable is Nandina, or it's also called Heavenly Bamboo. So Nandina uh, has historically been a very popular landscape plant because it's tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions and it has a uh, few pests and a uh, few major diseases uh, and it's evergreen, so it keeps its leaves all year. Also, it's generally overall low maintenance. However, it has been shown to have some invasive qualities and in that it may be harmful to local birds when they eat the berries. So that's uh, it can be considered an invasive quality. So a wide variety of plants that can be bought at garden centers may be sustainable in some ways, but they don't offer the same environmental services or benefits that their native counterparts do. And that is our main focus today, to look at native plants and how they fit as an alternative to more commercial landscape plants. And uh, these are a few of the benefits of landscaping with native plants. For one, native plants provide resources like food and shelter for wildlife, and this is also uh, helpful in promoting a healthier environment with greater biodiversity. Also, native plants have a natural and unique scenic value, so that's maybe in the eye of the beholder, the, the aesthetic value, and they provide lots of educational opportunities for youth and adults. They also, over time, require less inputs like fertilizer and pesticides. So let's quickly spend a bit more time focusing on what exactly defines a plant as being native. So the definitions vary over, over different sources, but generally in the United States, a native plant occurs naturally in a particular region and the, the ecotypes exist without human intervention. So we'll talk a bit more about what ecotypes are in the next slide. Native plants generally are considered to be present in the environment before the, b before the contact from uh, European settlers over 500 years ago. So, and these native plants are a part of ecoregions. So these are areas that have generally similar types of environmental settings and resources, or otherwise known as ecosystems. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit more about ecotypes here and ecoregions. And what we're looking at here is the Illinois Natural Regions Map, also called uh, the Natural Divisions Map, which is developed in 1985. So those, are, those words are synonymous. The Natural Regions Map is the same as the Natural Divisions Map. And what this focuses on is ecoregions, which share similar landscapes, climates, and geological history. So in these natural divisions, we may find native species that have adapted to the local conditions and what we call uh, ecotypes, uh, species ecotypes. And we call these adapted species a, uh, a, of a specific race. So any given native species that's considered native to the wider region of Illinois, for example, may have a specific ecotype that arises within one of these ecoregions, within one of these smaller uh, uh, special environments. 
So in Southern Illinois, I think you can see my cursor down here. So in Southern Illinois and Jackson County, uh, we're at the confluence of up to five different uh, eco, eco regions. And so we have a, a lot of diversity here. Um, so we're very lucky in that, in that respect. But then we have these wide ranges of other eco regions and um, uh, natural divisions within the area. So this is a really interesting look at all of the unique environments we have where these native plants exist. And because there is such a wide range of diversity here, we'll be focusing on plants that are broadly suitable for most of Illinois. So we're not really gonna focus on specific plants that are only going to be found in one small region. Uh, these are going to cover kind of the, the, the range of Illinois, although Illinois covers quite a long, a long range of hardiness zones. So we're looking at the difference between ecological restoration versus natural landscaping. And ecological restoration is going to involve a bit of a different approach. It's going to look a little bit different. It's developing landscapes, uh, at, landscapes that are going to be more about restoring a natural ecosystem as opposed to natural landscaping. In ecological restoration, we're really attempting to mimic or recreate a natural ecosystem for the benefit of wildlife with less influence by humans. On the other hand, natural landscaping is using some of those ideas, but adapting them <clears throat> for a landscape that features access and recreation for people as a major goal of that, of that landscape. So that's really the main goal of native and natural landscaping to try to reintroduce the plants that are better suited to our natural environment and thereby creating a more sustainable landscape, an overall more sustainable landscape. And here we see a map of Illinois and just at a glance, we can see how much of the native landscape we've lost to development over the last uh, century and a half. So maybe a better way to think about native landscaping is to think of think of it as encouraging a healthier environment by using natural history and our our kind of uh, uh, natural environmental history as a guideline, and and it is it is really significant and and a, a real significant illustration of of the changes in the environment over the last 150 years. We've gone from a lot more uh, natural kind of ecosystems that are in balance to, to mostly agriculture and urban development. So, so that's what we're really trying to do is regain some of that with natural natives, uh, native landscaping. And first we need to take a bit of inventory. That's really the first step with any new landscape project. So, with inventory, we're taking a look at what our environmental conditions are, mainly. And that starts with what our USD hardiness zone is. So uh, in Illinois, we go from five to down to seven at the very bottom. So knowing generally where our USD hardiness zones are. And also, what kind of garden are we desiring? Or is it more of a wild woodland kind of garden? Or are we wanting something with a little bit more control and a little bit more intentional kind of design to it. And natives can work in both of those. Also, uh, what are the soil conditions? That's gonna be really important. Uh, how much maintenance are we willing to commit to or how much maintenance do we really have time to, to handle? So that's, that's important to understand. And we also really need to know how much space we have for these types of species. And from there, we can start to kind of pick out what our favorites might be. And, and what might be most successful for our needs. So most commercially available landscape plants need approximately seven hours of sun for optimal growth as a general kind of guideline, six to seven hours. However, 
Uh, uh, many native plants are shade tolerant to some extent and quite a few uh, prefer shade and lend themselves to these common conditions that we find in the landscape. And some good examples are pawpaw, uh, low bush or, or half high bush blueberry, huckleberries, uh, ferns, sedges, may apples, these, these kind of things, trilliums, uh, kind of the uh, uh, ephemerals, uh, and many, many more uh, examples. And we'll talk about a few of these in detail. But let's look at a few other considerations. These are a few more factors that we should consider when looking at plants for a specific area in our landscape. So even within one, one homeowner's uh, residential landscape, there may be several pockets of different, different conditions and microenvironments. So a lot of these species need to be allowed to grow to their natural shape. So we should be thinking about pruning to their natural shape as opposed to pruning them to the shape we would want them to be. Uh, they don't they don't do as well they they they're going to be stressed and under uh, difficult conditions that we're pruning them too hard in many cases so planning for full size is important and as we look at uh, this photo we can see that uh, in a in a kind of a more woodsy uh, native understory it can become very dense so plants can be quite aggressive even native plants uh, they, they can become quite competitive and may need occasional cutting back or splitting up. And some other considerations are root depth. Uh, native plants tend to have pretty extensive deep roots. So if there's an issue with our, our residents or some, some kind of obstruction where deep roots wouldn't be good, then we need to be aware of that. And uh, if these plants are going to be exposed to any kind of de-icing or other chemicals, uh, they can be more sensitive to those those types of uh, um, exposure. So being, being aware of that and taking that under account is also important. Okay, so considering one of the most noticeable and important factors of a landscape is that the aesthetic or visual impact is going to be the first thing we notice. It's the first thing we see. And so there's a wide variety of native plants that we can use as alternatives to these more common non-native landscape plants. And some examples are uh, as a great replacement for invasive calorie pears or Bradford pears, we can substitute those with flowering dogwood and that specific uh, native species is Cornus florida. Also, uh, there are native crab apple trees that we can use as alternatives for, uh, for the Bradford pear or the calorie pear. Another great substitute uh, is uh, burn, uh, for burning bush, which is now becoming an invasive issue in, in forested parts of Illinois. A uh, good substitute is low, blo low bush blueberry uh, or even eastern wahoo. And both of, both of these have uh, vibrant red leaves in the fall, so they have that similar really striking vibrant color. And they kind of fill that, uh, that gap in the, in the landscape. And, um, Hazelnut also has a great fall color that can be used as an alternative. So I personally love Japanese maples, but they're not native and they don't provide the same kind of, again, those ecological resources. Uh, so a good uh, substitute for, for Japanese maple would be black lace elderberry. And that's, that's a native cultivar, or it's also called a nativar of the more common elderberry. So uh, elderberry, the common elderberry is not gonna have the same kind of uh, lacy kind of black leaf, but this is a commercially available cult of uh, native art. So those were just a few uh, examples of woody perennials, but there's also a ton of diversity in the Forbes category. So the, for, the forbs are more herbaceous perennial plants, and these can be used in the landscape to add dimension of color and texture throughout the year. And these are just a few examples of forbs and some grasses. We have 
Butterfly milkweed here, that's a really popular one, and it's kind of the poster child for the conservation of monarchs. Uh, Blue fall indigo here, larkspur, this is Joe pieweed, this is uh, ground cover, uh, wild ginger, and you can even use this as an edible uh, landscape plant. So it, it checks a lot of these uh, desirable boxes off. Uh, Phlox, uh, the uh, prairie blazing star. Then we have uh, switchgrass, sedges here, uh, big blue stem, Indian grass, and prairie drop seeds. So these are just a quick handful, but there are so, so many more. Okay, so one part of the important relationship between native plants and the environment is the strong symbiotic relationship that native plants share with soil microbes. And native plant species, including prairie plants, have strong associations with beneficial fungi, which are called mycorrhiza. So this mycorrhiza helps the plant roots to access otherwise unavailable nutrients and water. And the fungi, in return, receives sugars or other beneficial resources from the plant in exchange. And prairie type plants have a stronger association with uh, what's called ectomycorrhiza. And so this meaning they associate with the outside of the plant roots. While woodland plants, uh, a, lot of, a lot of woodland plants, not all, but uh, hardwood trees, pine trees, and other kind of uh, woodland plants have a stronger association with endomycorrhiza, and that means that they associate with the inside of the roots. So because the symbiosis improves overall soil health and function, it by extension helps plants to be healthier and uh, better established. So this helps plants to be more resistant to diseases and stress, thus reducing uh, more needs for pesticides and herbicides. And mycorrhizal inoculums can be purchased at garden centers. It's, it's a uh, commercial product uh, and it's, uh, it's available for purchase online, but it's uh, usually applied when planting new plants and it can be applied in, in, a, in a range of forms from a wettable powder to, uh, to a granular kind of thing. And I do have resources for more information on that. Okay, and talking a little bit more about the extensive root structures of native plants, this image is a really great way to visualize how native plants are adapted to local climate and soil conditions. And as an example, uh, native Illinois prairie plants are adapted to high winds and dry spells by having long extensive roots to anchor the soil and reach water that would otherwise be unreachable to shallower rooting plants. So they can reach down deeper into the soil and pull up uh, resources. Uh, these long roots also provide erosion control and over time they require less water and fertilizer uh, inputs from the gardener. And this makes these plants resilient to uh, major swings in weather that we get in the Midwest like drought, heavy rains, and uh, our temperature extremes. And just a quick, quick example of, of, the, of the vast difference between kind of our most common landscape uh, ecosystem, which is turf. This is the, the depth of uh, roots of a common uh, lawn, turf, compared to the uh, extensive root structure of a lead plant. So we're looking at, uh, you know, a few inches compared to up to 15 feet. So it's, it's, it's a pretty extreme difference. Okay, and so here we have some examples of ecosystems that we can try to mimic or recreate in the, in the residential or even in a public landscape. So uh, if it's safe right now for you to take a walk in the woods or a state park, uh, wherever you are, that's a, uh, that's a great way to get some ideas and inspiration for how to approach and how to start designing your landscape with natural elements. 
So first we need to take some inventory again of the site where we are wanting to create a new landscape or modify a landscape. And we need to look at conditions like shade and water and uh, soil. So if it's in an area like a pond or near, uh, near water source, we're gonna be looking at more of a lakeshore environment. So perhaps that's, uh, perhaps um, it's near our uh, uh, lake or pond. And so there, there are lots of uh, native plant species that are gonna be adapted to being able to spend longer times in water or spending most of the time in water. Uh, perhaps it's near a creek or a spring, or maybe there is a man-made creek uh, that's been, uh, that we can build around. And this would be similar to like a woodland stream environment that we might find. And uh, we can adapt a wide range of plants for this kind of ecosystem. So on the other hand, uh, for drier areas, we would be looking at creating a dry kind of prairie or what we call like a mesic prairie landscape. And mesic just means it gets a moderate amount of water, not a lot. Uh, and Zarek would be on the very far side of that where it's extremely dry. So this kind of environment here would be like our mesic prairie landscape. And this would be well adapted for sedges, uh, grasses, and in some other kind of prairie forbs like compass plant or cup plant. And then for a, more of an upland kind of oak hickory forest that we might find maybe in Southern Illinois, uh, this, this would kind of have more heavy shade probably. And we can use a lot of different understory shrubs and flowers in this kind of setting. And maybe we could have a mix of these different environments depending on what's around in, in our environment. So, and depending on conditions. So uh, what we're looking at is kind of mimicking or, or kind of reinventing uh, the natural ecosystems that we find. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at some examples of native landscapes and, some, and a few design layouts. And here are some examples of a native full sun prairie at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And this is a, a really great part of the Chicago Botanic Garden um, where, they've, where it's an all natives kind of environment. And it goes from full sun to shade to, to the kind of wet riparian that we looked at. And uh, so notice here the, the, the use of hardscapes as well as the mixtures of plants here, how they're massed together. So the mix of textures, heights, and colors of the plants. So it's, it's kind of a, a really interesting composition. And the hardscape as well, they've, they've made a, a, an intentional use of natural materials. And I, I tend to think natural materials lend themselves to native plants, kind of with that sort of natural uh, material and, and natural look. So we're using wood, brick, these kind of uh, materials. And here we see how they've used a natural turf path as a way to define the beds. And I think that works really well. And it kind of, they're also using height to, to stair, uh, step down the, uh, the scale of plants so that we can see all of the plants in this, in this berm and in these, um, in these borders here. Okay, so this is an example of a specialized type of garden system called a rain garden. And the main purpose of a rain garden is to catch and recycle stormwater runoff. And they often include native plants in the design. A majority are going to be using native plants. And native plants are ideal for rain gardens because of their tolerance to water and drought stress as we saw earlier, and as are going to be most present in rain gardens. And so this is an example of a full sun rain garden with a mix of forbs and grasses, and a sedge I think is in there. And uh, just a quick note, these plants don't necessarily have to be used in a rain garden. Uh, these are just some examples of how to use native plants that can be combined in similar conditions. So we see the big blue stem that we mentioned, uh, milkweed. Uh, we've got uh, sedge here, prairie blazing star. And so that's a look at a full sun rain garden. 
This is another example of a plant list developed for a full sun rain garden that I helped design and install uh, in Jackson County last year. So these plants were used in a, in a bioretention or rain garden. And again, pretty, pretty similar mix here. So this was for a rain garden that was in a pretty wet area. So in the very bottom of it, we are um, in the wetter parts of this rain garden, the parts that stay the most wet, we're using a lot of sedge. So sedge are really well adapted to, to wet, tough conditions. But we also have uh, things for color and, and other interest, uh, blue flag iris, uh, swamp rose mallow. So that's just a plant list there for, for an example. This is yet another good example from Purdue University. And this is for a shady rain garden. So something that might be a little bit heavier shade instead of complete full sun. And so the shape of this, this bean shape is really arbitrary. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that shape. Uh, this is just the layout. So notice the massings of ferns, uh, columbine, and other flowering forbs in here like wild geranium. So we're using massings of texture and color throughout this design to, to, to add, uh, to provide a good mix of foliage, texture, and bloom over the growing season. Okay, we've got one more design example here. This is a design from my backyard here in Southern Illinois. And this is an example of how to approach a shady wet area in, in the yard, which is maybe one of the most common uh, troublesome spots for gardeners. As far as, as, far as what, I've, what I've run into, uh, in my experience, it seems to be the most common and challenging issue. So I've included this as, as just an example. And I've included native trees and shrubs like redbud and elderberry that are tolerant of wetter, shady conditions. So those are, are gonna be well adapted to, to these environmental conditions. Along with uh, some understory plants and uh, ground cover that will provide unique interest throughout the year. So we've got, we've got uh, wild ginger in there, we've got some bee balm and some ferns in there. And I included some uh, shade and water tolerant sedum around the access to my HVAC there as a low maintenance ground cover. So as it is now, the ground cover consists of mostly just debris. So I wanted, I thought it'd be nice to have something a little bit more intentional there. So this is a pretty simple layout for just a basic uh, shade, shadier, wetter area. And, you know, I've taken other bits of information here for inventory. I've noted wet clay. I, I know where my afternoon shade is. I get maybe four, four or five hours of full or part sun in the, in the morning. So these are just little notes to kind of help determine what plants might work best. And here's one more example of a shady garden bed. And this one features some bee balm, some purple coneflower over here, and some taller plants, so that's noticeable here. So some taller plants like compass plants and cup plants on the back uh, border, on the back edge. And these help create a backdrop for the other shorter plants in the front. So they kind of help to frame things up, up in the front here. Okay, so for these remaining slides, we're going to look at some great examples of shrubs and trees that are suitable for most of Illinois, natives for most of Illinois. And these plants are tolerant of a wide range of conditions, but tend to tolerate low fertility, wet conditions and shadier conditions. And so another just a, a point to remember is that these species can become quite large. So giving enough space is important and pruning to shape Planning to prune to shape is important. So here we've got uh, American elderberry, and this is a really versatile perennial native. It's full sun to part shade, 
gets up to maximum 12 by 12 foot spread, and again, tolerates uh, tough conditions, um, can be used in wetter areas. And it uh, has these clusters of, of uh, white flowers in, in late June, July. And then later in the year, we get these uh, black elderberry clusters. So elderberries are medicinal. Uh, they can be used in jams, juices, all kinds of uh, edible applications. Great for attracting pollinators and has kind of a unique foliage. So, uh, and this is gonna be common for a lot of these shrubs is great for naturalized areas, shrub borders, screens. If you're wanting to create a, a, a living screen, uh, great for like the back part of a, of, a, of a bed or a border and good for along streams and low spots. Okay, so we've got here downy serviceberry. And this one is gonna be the most well adapted for conditions across Illinois. There are lots of, uh, there are a few other native service, service berry uh, species, but this one in particular is gonna be pretty much a, a good general use for, for the state. Uh, a perennial native, and it's got more of an upright, uh, uh, more, more of an upright uh, shape. So uh, 12 feet tall up to six feet wide. Uh, a really nice uh, low maintenance shrub. It can even almost be considered a small tree in some ways, but it's, uh, it's got white flower clusters in April that give way to uh, blueberries in uh, June. And these kind of look like uh, dark, uh, almost like small blueberries. And uh, they are not, this, this particular service berry uh, is very attractive to birds, but uh, to humans, the, uh, the berry is uh, more or less tasteless. Now, there are some service berries like Saskatoon that have a, a flavorful berry. This one, though, not so much. Um, again, kind of the same uses as, uh, other, uh, as the uh, elderberry. Okay, so a couple more here. Black chokeberry, another perennial native shrub, which most of these are, and not to be confused with choke cherry. So choke cherry is a native, but the berries and the leaves uh, contain um, uh, a toxic uh, 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 arsenic. Arsenic is, is, uh, is the toxin in there, so you want to avoid those. And these are uh, adapted to full sun, to part shade, uh, anywhere between uh, three by six uh, spread and, and height. Very low maintenance, again, good for wet areas. Another one with white flowers in May. And then we get these nice clusters of berries in late summer to autumn, these kind of dark clusters of berries. Uh, and they are edible, although they're very astringent, so they're going to have a, a very um, off-putting flavor, a very striking uh, flavor if eaten raw. So they're, they're going to be kind of something that we're going to want to maybe juice or, or turn into a jam or process in some way. This has good fall color, is very attractive to pollinators, and is great for uh, beds, accents, uh, good for shade areas. Um, and now looking at one of my favorites, the low bush or half high bush blueberry. So these are blueberries that don't get too large uh, and they, they can handle shade. So, so they can handle part shade. And they, the, the, the one special kind of need is they, they need a bit more acidity. acidity. So if they're maybe in an area around other, some other evergreens or maybe your azaleas or uh, rhododendrons, things like this that can also uh, benefit from a, a bit more acidity, this might be a good spot for them. Uh, they have the, the white flowers in May and then we get starting in June here, which I'm looking forward to. We start to get our blueberries and they ripen quickly. So this is something we, we're gonna be picking every day. But again, they have that, they also have that great fall color. So they offer a lot throughout the year. Very attractive to most animals. And uh, of course the berries are edible. Uh, so again, good for kind of woodland gardens and uh, borders or just as uh, accent pieces even. And 
Um, they can do part shade, probably they'll grow, but you won't get too much fruit if it doesn't have maybe four to five hours uh, of, of, of some at least dappled, dappled sun to, to get some fruit off of those. And we mentioned eastern wahoo or eastern burning bush earlier. So this is a, a euonymus species, but this is a euonymus that's native to the Midwest, as opposed to the uh, non-native euonymus burning bush that is the most one of the most popular landscape uh, shrubs. And so this euonymus or eastern wahoo is uh, prefers full sun to dappled shade. And it can get quite large from uh, 15, up to 15 by 15 height and spread. So it's kind of a, a, a kind of a rounded shape. And uh, low maintenance, uh, again, wide range of tolerances to, to wet, wet or dry areas. And it's got that uh, really nice vibrant red foliage in the fall. And it does produce berries. So the berries are considered poisonous to humans, though some uh, birds do use them as food. Uh, the, the, the kind of the toxic aspect of the, the berries were utilized by Native Americans and settlers as a, as a purgative. So that's a, a medicinal use, but they're, they're, they're not really used for kind of uh, nutrition, I would say, and a wide range of uses here. It's just a good overall utility plant for the native garden, the native woodland garden. Oops. Okay, and then we have purple beautyberry. So this is suggested for kind of the general use in Illinois. Now, this is the only one that's not exactly native. This is one. This is the um, overseas version, but closely related to its native counterpart, the uh, dichotoma species. And so this one is just going to be more tolerant to the wide range of conditions in Illinois. And but they, they still have that full sun to light shade, uh, the, uh, the, the same kind of mounding kind of form up to, up to six uh, feet by six feet and tolerant of uh, drier clay soils. So these are really striking because they have these uh, fuchsia or, or, or lavender, uh, almost magenta berries in fall, very attractive to birds. And the berries are edible, but they don't really have much of a palatable taste. Uh, so not really something you'd, you'd be interested in eating. And this is one that's, a, that's an exception as far as how much it can be pruned. It, it tolerates pruning more than some of these other examples. And lots of great uses here for uh, massings, great for massings and woodland gardens. And this is the native counterpart, the Calicarpa dichotoma. And I think these are the last examples of shrubs or small trees. And this is Farkleberry, also known as Sparkleberry. And I've also heard it called Huckleberry, but Huckleberry trees are different. So I, I don't think that that's accurate. I think more, more accurately, the common name would be Farkleberry or Sparkleberry. And these are uh, native to Giant City State Park. So we have these in, in, uh, in the understory in, in Giant City, and they stay smaller in that area. They also grow off of cliffs off of like cliff faces. So they're, they're, they're extremely adaptable to, to a wide range of environments, but they can get quite large. Uh, they have fragrant white flowers and the berries are very attractive to birds and other animals. However, it's, they're considered inedible to humans uh, and they're persistent. So one way to identify them in the winter is if you see these little black berries, uh, it could be a farkleberry. And uh, American hazelnut, this is another one that, that's uh, at least common in, in woods in Southern Illinois. And it's a deciduous shrub or, or even up to a small tree if it, gets, uh, if it gets enough light and can get up to 16 feet tall. And it has these uh, defining catkins here, these noticeable catkins in the spring. And then of course we get the edible hazelnuts that mature in July or August. And this is another one with good fall color and a lot of good uses for the, for the woodland kind of landscape and even up, upland and prairie landscapes. And then I have just two examples of trees here. So these are two of my favorite native trees. 
And so this is American persimmon, and it's a native of Illinois, and it's adapted to most of Illinois. So it can get up to 60 feet tall and 30 foot spread, so it can become quite a large tree. Uh, it's very low maintenance, and it, it's, it's tolerant of a wide range of difficult conditions. So uh, low maintenance, and uh, it's uh, got fragrant white to greenish flowers that bloom in late spring, but the real kind of uh, main feature is in, in the fall, we get the reddish uh, purple fruit, and those may persist on the tree into winter. So those are, have such a narrow window of, of edible value. And, and the, 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 I think the kind of common uh, wisdom with these is that they're not edible until you get your first hard frost. And I found that out the hard way by eating uh, an unripe persimmon, which is uh, quite an experience. I wouldn't recommend it. And uh, so these are large ornamental, ornamental landscape trees, and they're a good focal point. They could be a good replacement even for, uh, for a maple or some other kind of uh, uh, shade tree like that. And then, oops, last one here is pawpaw. And so the pawpaw tree is uh, a native and uh, very easy to grow, but it, it does create groves because it spreads, uh, it spreads through rhizomes and creates uh, thickets. Well, it's uh, runners, it spreads through runners. And um, it's, uh, it's got dark purple flowers in May. And so the, the pollinators that it attracts is very unique. It attracts flies because the, the flowers have kind of a, a unique odor to them. So, so they, they, they use a different uh, sort of pollination and they produce oblong brown fruit that kind of vaguely resemble kiwis, I think. And those ripen in October. And so the flavor, I've, I've managed to find a couple ripe ones and the flavor is really unique and they have these big black seeds that you have to uh, work around, but the flavor is kind of a, almost like a mango or banana. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. And uh, they do create uh, groves through rhizomes. So uh, managing these might be cutting them back and, um, and, or if you'd like to let them turn into a grove, that, that's also a way to uh, use these. And they're shade tolerant, very shade tolerant as well. Okay, so some concluding thoughts about design considerations. Uh, location and, and enough space is super important for uh, the success of some of these plants. And making sure your neighborhoods or HOAs don't have restrictions for kind of more wild looking or certain types of landscapes. Most of the time, it shouldn't be an issue if it's not, if it's somewhat managed, if it's not uh, turning into the wild kind of jungle look. But uh, most of the time, not an issue. And um, you could probably sneak in a few natives if there, if there are more uh, rules about that. You know, a lot of these alternatives, maybe nobody had noticed. Uh, so again, look to, to look to the natural environment for inspiration and use plants suited to your site's conditions. That's important. Uh, also make sure that new plants are close to a water source or have access to water. While many native plants will require less water over time, they still do have what's called an establishment period. And that's uh, anywhere from one to two years. Uh, and uh, where, the, where they're still going to require supplemental watering in the warmer parts of the month. So the general guideline is an inch to an inch and a half a week, at least in the first year. Maybe in the second year, if it's a forb, it may not need quite as much. Maybe every couple of weeks, you just need to do a, a, a really deep watering. So natives prefer infrequent deep watering instead of, less, instead of more frequent uh, light watering and a great way to do this is to have a soaker hose on a timer that you can set up to where it runs once a week in the, in the, in the hottest parts of the summer uh, for maybe 15, 30 minutes, you know, have a soaker hose set up. And uh, that would be a great option for watering and uh, easy, uh, easy way to do it. And then just kind of start out small and go from there and kind of learn as you go. So 
I think maybe with natives, it's it's one of these things to maybe experiment. Try 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 a, a native garden here, to see what works, uh, and uh, and then kind of learn and and uh, grow as you go. I guess so. Got a few more resources here. Here are some sources <clears throat> for obtaining native plants. And I've also put a link in here for a great resource from the Missouri Botanical Garden. And this looks at, in detail at handling common challenges uh, for spots in the garden like shade and heavy clay. And this is a list of links to resources and books that I use frequently for my research. I really like Illinois Wildflowers by Donald Kurz, and I also like uh, Native Plants for the Home Landscape for the Upper Midwest. And these will be available for you to view on YouTube once this is posted, so you will be able to see all these links again. And I quickly want to show you this link to the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant publication on wildflowers because I find it to be a really outstanding visual resource. It's, it's awesome. So we'll see what happens here. I'll take a look at this real quick, but uh, I'll just quickly show it to you, but I'd recommend checking it out and reading over the whole thing when you have some time. So this is just a PDF of this, <clears throat> and this is a guide to Illinois native plants, mostly Forbes, I think, in here. And this is just great because it shows in a, in a really cool visual uh, representation of how these look from spring into winter. So it gives us the full season uh, uh, value or visual value of, of these. And, and we have uh, forbs, grasses, sedges. And then over here, it also tells us the recommended environment, uh, uh, cultural requirements for these. So uh, the level of light, the expected height and um, soil types tells us what they attract, drought tolerance, spacing, lots of great information here. And this is just one of these publications through uh, the I Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. There, there are a couple others. There's one for woodland gardens, one for rain gardens. So I would highly recommend doing, uh, looking into those a bit more. And now getting back to our slides here. Here are a few more retail resources for the Midwest region. And I know that right now it's probably a challenge to get native plants from traditional local sales and events. A lot of those are, you know, kind of up in the air. And so the online option may be what's available right now. So I would take a look at these. Um, I will say that because of, because of a lot of the local native plant sales being canceled, there has been kind of a run on native plants uh, this year. So um, maybe you, you can get some seeds and, and, and look into starting some of these at home. But these are options to look at and uh, good, good retail resources. And if you're interested in the mycorrhiza for uh, the inoculation of, uh, of these native plants, I would start my, my investigation with the reforest, Reforestation Technology International site, and um, that's here. So I would take a look at that, and it's a good place to start to learn more. Now, they're going to be more for restoration projects and large-scale ecology projects, but they really do a good job of explaining the kind of the science behind the, these uh, mycorrhizal inoculums. Uh, here's my contact info if you have further questions after this. And here's the info for our Extension Horticulture YouTube channel, where uh, this recording is going to be uploaded along with previous Four Seasons webinars that you can check out uh, that are available for your viewing. And I just want to say thank you for joining us today. So this one last bit of info here, this is a QR code for you to be able to access a brief evaluation and give us feedback if, uh, if, you're, if you'd like. 